Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see you all here tonight, and welcome to this, the third of this year's conversations at the Carter Center. Uh, my name is Tom Crick. I'm the associate director of our conflict resolution program here and run our Liberia uh, rule of law projects. Um, and as I said, it's a great pleasure to see so many uh, people here tonight. Uh, this Conversations at the Carter Center is a series that gives the Carter Center an opportunity to discuss our efforts in uh, peace and health and current world issues with our neighbors uh, in Atlanta uh, and others beyond. Uh, we welcome here you tonight, and I want to give a special welcome to the many groups of uh, students who have come out tonight, uh, from Emory, the Institute of Developing Nations, and from the Masters of Development uh, Practice program. Also to welcome the online audience uh, watching tonight via a live uh, webcast. Shortly I'll introduce uh, two distinguished uh, colleagues of mine who've kindly agreed to join us in a discussion on tonight's theme, Justice for the Poor. Uh, following about a 40-50 uh, minute conversation We'll open the floor up to uh, any questions and look forward to a, uh, a lively uh, discussion. First, uh, I want to say a couple of words about why justice for the poor. Those of you who have uh, been to previous events at the center will know that the focus of the Carter Center's mission, waging peace, fighting disease, and building hope, is on the so-called bottom billion of the world's uh, population, or those living in extreme poverty. The center tends to work in countries at the intersection between this poverty and poor governance, poor health, poor development, and poor human rights, and often in countries that are either in or recovering from war. The center is not, however, a classical expert in uh, rule of law uh, programming, as it's uh, conventionally understood, but in a couple of countries recently, post-conflict, we've began to develop our own brand of programming to try to establish uh, a common understanding of conditions by which people can live together, uh, to reestablish the rules for civil order, um, often understood as justice or, or the implementation of the rule of law. One of these uh, programs is in Liberia, another in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And before we start our conversation, I wanted to show you a very brief video uh, of some of our activities in Liberia, which represent an effort to provide a community level uh, justice service where the formal system and the informal system are both yet to successfully uh, provide anything that could be called justice to the citizens. One of the things we try to do is to find creative ways to deliver services uh, in short order uh, rather than waiting for uh, lengthy structural reforms that can take uh, many years if they ever succeed in creating um, any form of justice. So let me show this uh, small video then we'll uh, introduce uh, our other panelists and begin the discussion of what we mean by justice for the poor. Thank you very much. My name is Michael T. Bido. I am the lead monitor for the Catholic Justice and Peace Commission Regional Office in Banga Bong County, Central Liberia. In partnership with the Carter Center, we have been working together in strengthening the rule of law through the Access to Justice Project. As a result of what we do, people have gotten the information, the education, and they are coming over to the JPC for help. The impacts are just numerous. I am making a follow-up with one of my clients who brought a case over in mid Judah of this year. My name is Edna Flomo. He went to spend time demanding good people. So when he left there, he died. And all in front of they buried him on to us. Her son was spending time with the grandparents. 
meaning the boyfriend's parents. She met the father on that morning and asked, how well is my son doing? And he responded, oh, your son is fine. But to her, to her amazement, by five o'clock in the evening, the child's father came to tell her that the child died and he has been buried. Helen said she, you know, it was, she almost collapsed. And her parents and other family members came in and said, I mean, it was, it was fishy. That suspicion was leading to ethnic tension in the community, which would have, you know, undermined the peace this community currently enjoys after many years of violence. We immediately convened a conference of both parties. Fortunately, the child died in a, you know, in the premises of the hospital. So immediately, the two parties selected representatives to go along with me to the, the Phoebe hospital. When we got there, after I have introduced myself to the medical doctor, he said he was on duty when the child was brought in. And from post-mortem examination he performed, the child died as a result of cardiac arrest, resulting to you know, acute blood shortage and severe malaria. He made that the open disclosure in the presence of both Helen and the ex-boyfriend. As you see, this is the copy of the medical certificate from the hospital that was shared with the both parties. I think which they accepted in principle. They have performed the traditional uh, ceremony that brought the both families together and relationship has been restored. Excuse me while I find my, the correct piece of paper to make the correct introduction. Hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my very great pleasure uh, to introduce um, not only two uh, experts in their field, but two people I've uh, had the great pleasure to work with uh, in Liberia and on other issues uh, over the past uh, five years or so. Um, both are committed to both scholarship but also to the practical application of scholarship. And this is where the Carter Center's work uh, intersects as we try to learn from the uh, lessons they can teach us uh, and we try to share the uh, information that we, uh, we gather in the field. Um, Dr. Pamela Scully is Professor of Women's Studies and African Studies and Chair of the Department of Women's Studies at Emory University. She has a PhD in history from the University of Michigan and her research focuses on comparative women's and gender history and more recently on the relevance of history to ensuring women's rights in post-conflict societies. She's writing a book entitled Humanitarian Interventions and Sexual Violence, which focuses on Liberia. Dr. Stephen Lubkerman is Associate Professor of Anthropology and International Affairs at George Washington University. Dr. Lukerman is a social cultural anthropologist whose work focuses primarily on social and political change in nations that have experienced protracted conflict and violence. Focuses also on migrants, refugees, and diasporas and on international development and humanitarian action. Also on the cultural heritage and mar maritime archeology. span uh, Dr. Lukman has worked extensively with migrants and refugees in uh, Mozambique, South Africa, Angola, and Liberia. And he has uh, worked on a variety of archaeological and cultural heritage projects in the U.S., Bermuda, and uh, Southern Africa. What I'd like to do is begin by asking uh, my colleagues, what is it that we typically think of uh, when we talk about restoring the rule of law after a, uh, after a period of conflict, or indeed of what we understand as of the rule of law 
um, at all? And what, how does that link to uh, concepts of uh, justice uh, that we may, uh, may carry with us? Steve, I don't... <laughs> I thought this was the maritime archaeology conference. Uh, <laughs> no, um, I think that's a. I mean, it's an interesting question. Uh, the first thing is maybe to realize that um, the interest in rule of law in post-conflict countries, um, the rule of law has really become part of what the international community thinks about uh, only in the last maybe ten years. If you were to go twenty years ago or twenty-five years ago in Mozambique, that was not part of the repertoire of what the international community even considered in post-conflict countries. Uh, and so it's changed. Now it's, it's along with human rights, a rights-based uh, rights perspective, uh, it's really one of the major pillars uh, of any international intervention. You see this in places like Liberia or Sierra Leone, uh, Afghanistan, and so forth. Um, but I think it means many different things to many different actors, rule of law. Uh, it's one of those uh, signs that is so powerful because it can mean so many different things at the same time. Some of them, interestingly enough, may be mutually contradictory. And so if you were to talk to, you know, if we were to have some folks here from uh, at least one of the wings of the World Bank, rule of law is about, uh, you know, securing property rights and, 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 and the rights of, of, uh, that, that we would associate with, uh, with private enterprise. If you were to talk to the human rights com uh, community, it's about... Uh, moving the human rights agenda forward. If you're to talk to legal scholars, it's really about um, putting into place uh, a system, uh, usually a formal system of justice uh, that we would recognize as such because it would be similar in many ways to that which we'd see here with courts and lawyers and so forth, uh, and based on similar types of principles. Um, uh, and uh, that perhaps is what we see more in, in Liberia and the rule of law. Uh, and I think... Can I add to that? Yeah. Because I think I would I mean, I completely agree, and I think some of the premises, even within that range of constituencies that uh, Stephen talks about, um, is premised increasingly, again, in the last 10 years, on the idea of good governance. So it's good economic governance, it's the state working, um, and indeed property rights in that rubric is part of it. So there's a... Um, a set of generally implicit assumptions that go with the term the rule of law that assume working states, assume that law looks a certain way, that assumes that uh, property rights or individual property rights are generally a good thing. And so uh, rule of law comes to be a sort of a, a standard bearer for a whole lot of perceptions about how the world works or should work that, that travel under the sign of the rule of law increasingly, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the most recent dispensation of rule of law that, that I think I've seen over the last couple of years has been securitization, security mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. rule of law. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the, in a sense, it's a, it's a debate, but I think that the shorthand, um, by and large, is people are looking or, or assuming that a system uh, that, that, that people are going, that peace is going to be consolidated and development is going to begin to take hold if uh, some semblance of system, legal system, formal system, that we are familiar with in one form or another, whether it's continental or, or commonwealth origin, uh, takes hold. And so in the last 20 years, whereas, say, in Mozambique in 1990, there really was no, you know, you, if you went to USAID or the Swedish International Development Agency or pick your, pick your bilateral donor or multilateral donor, there was no rule of law program. Now, all of them have a rule of law program. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it's become more and more an institutionalized part of the toolkit, a series of assumptions have gone, you know, a series of common practices have come to bear. You go in, you fix the Constitution. That's kind of step one. And, and so actually, because I think one of my concerns, and actually one of the reasons I love uh, working with Tom and the Carter Center is I think they have a very different and organically sort of emerging idea about what the rule of law might mean. But one of my worries about the larger rubric of the rule of law is it's about imposing order, which makes sense in that it, it, it does often get applied in, in post-conflict countries where, where, of course, people do want a, a level of order. But I, I do worry that um, the kind of issues that might have been on the table 20 years ago in sort of certain circles around, you know, justice, economic justice, who owns the businesses, you know, access to um, sort of 
opportunities to make wealth, etc., etc., get put off the table in the rubric of law and order and security concerns. And I think um, one of the reasons I like the Carter Center is that it, it seems to me to be quite often trying to put back a much broader conception of justice and a much more organic one that emerges from the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when Carter Center's been working in Liberia for a lot of years, and following the uh, election in 2005, uh, our mission was to go back and see what we could do uh, along with the rest of the international community to really help uh, solidify uh, the peace there. Um, so we, right from the get-go, were looking at what kinds of uh, interventions uh, or support to the, uh, to the desperately um, uh, resource-starved uh, government we could, uh, we could offer. Um, and in conversations with the Ministry of Justice, uh, they pointed to the greatest need was, uh, was twofold. One, for their citizens to, to know what it was that the Ministry of Justice was supposed to do. Uh, they were coming from a, a history that had led to war uh, in which the, uh, the state apparatus, including all of the institutions of, uh, of justice, the, the courts, the police, um, the uh, local governance, had been used as tools of, of uh, central control, more or less. They, they looked at the, uh, the state as something that was uh, you know, rapacious rather than as something there to pr protect their rights. And so the Ministry of Justice was trying to deliver the message um, that uh, you know, we're under new management, things are different now, that the, the, the state is, is, is not what you think it has been, by way of uh, educating people on, on changes in the law. Uh, women have property rights under, under the new government. Um, your rape is a much more serious crime under the new government. Um, that uh, the fees and uh, problems that you have in dealing with the courts and the police system are are uh, not, not to be uh, used. The corruption is not supposed to be a, an everyday part of government. So they were looking for help to communicate this outside of Monrovia, but they also were very, very aware that unless they could start convincing people of this, um, they weren't going to have a chance at uh, really uh, the other elements of development. So when Steve is talking about a pillar, uh, the rule of law being a pillar, uh, they weren't talking so much as we need to rebuild the court system. They were talking about we need to find creative ways to, to establish a link with the population and create some kind of trust, some kind of message that, uh, that things have been different. Now, I would argue you need both a formal and uh, other, kinds of, other kinds of systems. Um, but there's often uh, a real focus on the, on the formal because this is nuts and bolts and, and this is what lawyers... Uh, do and understand. They develop the bar association's capacity. They rebuild courtrooms. They, you can provide vehicles to to police, and other things. Um, but uh, you know, in parallel to that, there's often been a, a real absence of um, creative ways to reach out to build to try to build popular confidence. And I know we saw in some of the slides before the um, estimates of the United Nations of the of the sheer quantity of people in the world who do not have access to justice or, or confidence in their justice system. So the question becomes, um, you know, what kinds of uh, steps can be taken uh, to, uh, to address those things you know, before you get to the state of, uh, of revolution or before you get to the, the state of war? Um, um. And I think what, what Tom's talking about also gets on, uh, touches on issues of development and, and funding because um, Liberia in particular you know, is enjoying quite a lot of um, acclaim at the moment. It has a feminist president. Um, it, it does have a new government trying to do its best. And so there's a lot of international money coming to Liberia through USAID, through the UN, through you know, other donors. Um, and one of the, th the ways that that shapes... Um, programs is people tend to fund what they know. So they, you know, when they hear there needs to be rule of law, they do exactly what uh, Tom was saying and want to fund the lawyers and the magistrates and write up the laws. Um, and that, that's a real challenge in Liberia where I think Tom has the, has the correct um, number, but a very, very small proportion of Liberians actually 
go to seek justice in the formal sector. Um, for most Liberians, they're never going to see a magistrate, they're never going to see a court, they're lucky if they see a policeman. Um, and partly because of the history of uh, Liberia where a lot of the, the sort of state organs are concentrated in Monrovia. So for most Liberians, whatever happens in the formal justice system is really not going to touch their lives very much. So that if the Carter Center is to take seriously um, bringing uh, the idea of justice and having a justice that's actually realized um, to most Liberians, they have to go outside of the formal sector. And um, I did a, a short stay in Harper, which is in southeastern Liberia. And one of the, the areas of justice that I found so meaningful that if I was a donor where I'd be putting my money was these justice of the peace um, people who go out, they're funded by the Catholic Justice and Peace Commission, and they go out on motorbikes to these rural areas that are, you know, two, three days away from the nearest village, let alone the town. Um, and there they, they might be the first person that, that people have seen who represents, they don't really represent the state because they are, they are funded privately, but they do represent the idea of law working for individuals. And so one of the people um, I interviewed was, hand, was handing a case on domestic violence, and an, another person was ha handing a case of a small community that was having some issues around land appropriation by a local French rubber company. And it was in, I could see it was in those daily, weekly conversations about rights and how can we ensure that this community's land is protected and that the big rubber company doesn't take their land, that you could see the community begin to feel that justice actually meant something and justice was served. Um, and this was within the legal system because uh, these Justice of the Peace Commissioners are going out to sort of help these, these people access the justice system, but it's not, it's not the formal, you know, it's not lawyers going, they, they are paralegals in a sense, although I think that term has not been used in Liberia until very recently. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think one of the interesting, Carter at right now in Liberia, if, if I may speak as an outsider who has collaborated with you, represents a, uh, is an outlier. It's, it's sort of a, a very different approach. Um, I think you can ask two very different questions and, and they lead you in very different ways. So one is the conventional, um, how do we establish rule of law? And with that question, comes a whole series of formulas that again focus on let's, re let's rewrite the constitution, let's build the formal system. Mm -hmm. And there's an assumption there, okay, that first of all, you can build the formal system or that you're strengthening something that is, is going to then translate into providing justice to people and justice that they recognize as such. Um, and that's an assumption that often goes unquestioned. And I think that Liberia, but not only Liberia, if you go to Mozambique, Sudan, others, there are very good reasons why that assumption needs to be questioned. Mm -hmm. The other question is, uh, is a very different point of departure, which is uh, how do you provide people with justice? How do you improve access to justice? And that doesn't necessarily presume that the formal system is the only solution or the best solution or the most desirable solution, at least for certain periods of time in certain types of contexts. And so, I mean, if you take Liberia, so, so if you, you know, those are two different things. Mm -hmm. If you're going to ask about access to justice, then you have to ask a series, begs a series of other questions. How do people define justice? Is, is that necessarily exactly the same way we do? And if it is different, are there sound reasons for that given a different reality? So you have to ask that question. You have to not assume that you know that. Um, and then you have to be willing to look and take an empirical perspective, look at, okay, what does the formal system actually represent in, t in people's experience, and what are the alternatives? So Liberia is, I think, a case in point. Um, I mean, first of all, you know, you could go through what are some of the flaws in the formal system in Liberia? You've pointed out historically, it's, it's, it's been part of a system that has perpetrated injustice on the behalf of elites. So it already has, in some sense, a historically grounded lack of legitimacy. When people look at a court, they're not assuming that this is a place I'm going to be treated fairly. They're assuming it's going to uh, probably, based on a history of seen in the past, it's going to promote the, the, the interests of certain elites. Uh, then you can start going through you know, coverage. Um, well, you know, I mean, I think it was 2005 that the formal court system tried 21 cases and it went up the next year to 141 in a country where 200 people were imprisoned in, like, in Monrovia alone per year on rape charges. I mean, you can start doing the math. You know, how, how does that work? Um, so it has no coverage. 
uh, then you can go into the questions of how justice itself is defined. I mean, we can sort of defer that, but I think that there are a series of principles that we might think um, uh, are prioritized. We tend to prioritize punishment of the perpetrator. And often uh, people are more concerned with restoring, in this place, restoring the condition of the victim. So you have the, the person who is an arson and they protest when he's thrown into prison. Um, is that irrational? No. They said, you know, that's not helping us. Uh, make him rebuild the house. You know, I mean, there's something we could go into. Sort of the, it's not an, it's not an illogical and educated. It's, it's. There's a quite practical reason for that, and you know, there are many other things that to us might seem alien because we have other social institutions or economic conditions that, that allow us to deal with those things and only focus on. Uh, and there are other values, and so those have to be. You know, so if you're asking about access to justice, you have to go and you have to look. What does the formal system look like? And so in Liberia. You know, this was part of the a joint study the, that I conducted with the U.S. Institute for Peace, and Carter played a role in this as well. You know, we found that for the average Liberian, um, the the court, the formal court system, not only does not have coverage, but it's viewed as generally corrupt, as generally producing unjust and biased decisions. And in fact, people went so far as to say, if you want to perpetrate injustice, and you're a member of the elite, one of the best places to go is the court. Okay, so if you're asking the access to justice question, then you have to look at that and say, okay, what are alternatives, customary or uh, uh, CLAs, new institutions, um, community legal advisors? Um, but you have to ask, you, you know, you have to compare the realities on the ground. If you're simply doing, and there are people in Liberia and in other places too, you're sort of following sort of the assumptions of rule of law, you're working on strengthening those institutions. Well, interestingly enough, you may be strengthening institutions that people are looking at as perpetrating injustice. That's a problem if you're working on peace building. Mm -hmm. um, so those different points of departure of rule of law, which I think is sort of gained a conventional institutionalized approach versus the question of access to justice, that really a minority of institutions, more unconventional ones, maybe like Carter and uh, USIP and others, are asking, you know, that's a very different type of approach and it leads you in very different directions. Mm -hmm. I think it represents one of the strengths of, of what um, you know, of what, what's happened or what is happening right now um, in the programs in, in Liberia. Can I just, mm -hmm. uh, and that, I think the point that Stephen's just made about justice um, is, is relevant beyond Liberia. I've, I've written, is this part of my interest in, in how, you know, African history can help us think through some contemporary challenges is that uh, practically in every way in Africa was colonized so that um, the colonial state was, was not created as a state that was to benefit people in, in Africa was created precisely to take things away. And so, you know, the, the history of colonialism creates a, a particular kind of Western-looking state that is by its very nature and, you know, the point of, of being there is to be rapacious. And then the post-colonial states have tended to, in, you know, inherit that sort of point of view. And so um, I think it's a lesson that goes, you know, far beyond Liberia. Um, but, but also on the issue of justice um, in Liberia specifically, it's asking people particularly in this post-conflict setting, what they want, what they would see as justice in terms of dealing with perpetrators from during the war, is that, that the answers, again, are, are, are never univocal. There are different communities, different constituencies. And one of the dividing lines seems to be that when you ask women who um, suffered terrible rape and other depredations during the wars, what, what justice would mean to them in terms of perpetrators. Um, there were a series of women's dialogues that were held um, throughout Liberia, um, I think it was last year, um, which involved 600 women through various different communities talking about the experiences and what they would like to see as, what, would, what they would recognize as justice. And overwhelmingly, um, women said that they, you know, that the, the, the really, really bad guys should be, you know, put in prison or something. But really what they wanted was for the perpetrators, who many, most of whom are still living in their communities, these are people they see every day, their neighbors, etc., that they really wanted them to come and say sorry in a public setting and to confess to their sins and, and literally ask the, the forgiveness of the people, the women they had raped, and that that would be much more meaningful than hearing that you know, there'd been a, a trial. And so 
the, the, the forms of justice that women were wanting were, were much more restorative in terms of their communities, in terms of having a personal apology, a public apology, and that they wanted memorials, public memorials to the victims being uh, erected throughout Liberia. But it's not the redistributive justice of the criminal justice system where you, you, know, you go off the perpetrator, you put them in jail. And I think part of it is exactly what Stephen's take, talking about is it partly also has to do with the recognition of um, does the law work in Liberia? Even if, even if you were to have a trial, will the perpetrator actually be you know, put away? Um, and it has to do with the kind of communities that people are living in, which is that they are living in the very communities where the perpetrators are living. And so they, they need to feel safe, and they cannot feel safe unless the perpetrators have said, you know, I, I publicly recognize I did something terrible, and I'm sorry. And even then, that, it's only a measure of safety, but it is an important measure for women. No, I, I think that's a, that's a very important point for a couple of reasons. I mean, when you look at the, at the rights community or sometimes the rule of law community, there's a tendency to uh, either be very selective, you know, there's, there's always the mantra of participation and listening. Um, but it's selective listening, and often it's very patronizing. And so for, this would be a good example. They, you know, they often would look and say, well, you know, example of false consciousness. How can they, you know, is this, are people uh, simply appealing to some sort of mm -hmm. cultural values because they don't know better? And mm -hmm. uh, th in fact, these people, these, these women are very astute readers of their realities. I mean, th they don't deserve to be patronized. They survived 15 years of a war mm -hmm. that probably the majority of us in this room would not survive. So that means they know what they're doing. They, they have some sense of how to navigate this reality. Um, and so when they, at, when they make the suggestion that the best thing would be an apology as opposed to imprisoning somebody, mm -hmm. uh, or I could give an example from our research where uh, a young woman had been raped and the, the remedy that uh, was proposed through the customary system was that her rapist would be responsible for taking her with a family member uh, for the weekly visits to the hospital to, to deal with the, the problem that had occurred as a result. And all of us, I think, probably react, oh my gosh, this is, per you know, mm -hmm. uh, this is terrible. How could anybody come up with this solution? But you have to look at what, I mean, first of all, there is no other remedy, there is no other social institution or mechanism in this place for, first of all, dealing with the condition of the victim. So they have to come up with, a, if, the, if that's the primary concern, um, and that may be different from our primary concern here, which is punishment, but it's very practical. M maybe we don't have that concern because we do have social institutions that, mm -hmm. that can deal with that. Um, uh, they uh, are recognizing the reality of a level of economic interdependence within the community, that people do have to live with each other. They do have to depend on each other for subsistence. There is no social security check. You know, when you get old, you have to, you have to live with, there is no, even if they wanted to put somebody in prison, they're in a system that where people literally bribe their way out of prison all the time. You, if you have a problem, the last person you probably go to is a police officer because, or even a magistrate. We have record of rape victims being re-victimized mm -hmm. in the most literal sense by the police or, you know, or if the police at, at best are going to be the source of a, 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 a bribe request and at worst are going to maybe perpetrate rape themselves. So once you start thinking, okay, these are a series of realities, are, is this assessment, is this solution that people are coming to one that is simply you know, cultural and the result of the inertia of this is what we've always done, or is it a very practical reading of the reality on the ground? And so uh, I think, again, the rule of law approach often says, oh, that's different from what we do and what we think should be done, again, without recognizing all of those other realities that don't operate, um, versus an access to justice approach, which, is, which, which, says, which really says, okay, how is it that you define justice and makes a different assumption? You probably, the assumption is you probably know what you're talking about. We simply don't understand the context. Let's inform ourselves about that first. Um, and I think that that's a much less patronizing and recognizes, in fact, the astute the, 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 the astute reading that these people really do have of their reality. Uh, and again, surviving 15 years of a war is, is no mean feat. And can I? Um, and, and to add to that around the issues of gender and, and violence, um, I organized a dialogue in, in Monrovia among uh, Liberians who work in NGOs around gender-based violence and some 
uh, South African counterparts. I'm originally from South Africa um, because I thought the South Africans had, um, to some extent, come through you know a civil war and had were at least working on on, on democracy and taking gender seriously. Um, and so I thought it would be a helpful conversation. And one of the things we did was to look at uh, recommendations that would have been brought drawn up specifically for. Uh, people in Liberia by an American university of, of you know, a decent law school where the students had sort of worked out a kind of best practices uh, sheet for um, people involved in, in sort of legal issues when they were faced with domestic violence. And so the sheet was very recognizable, you know, go to the lawyer, go to the judge, you know, take the, the woman to the doctor, um, et cetera. All the, you know, go to the domestic abuse shelter, et cetera. And very beautifully you know, written and everything else. And so we, at the dialogue, we, we were asked if we would just look at this and give our um, opinions. And I mean, people started getting hysterical, saying, where, on what planet was this written? You know, the, the last person you would go to is the policeman. The first person you would go to is you know, either your aunt or the, 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 if you're in a village, the elder or the, head, the, the woman who's head of the secret society. Or, but the, the, the very categories of this best practices sheet, which, would, which were done with all good intention and would work pretty well in New York probably, maybe, um, just we literally did not work in Liberia, in part because it didn't take into account all the things that Stevens just said. And so um, these issues of of trusting people that they actually do have ideas and do actually know the way the world works and have solutions within their own, the world that they live in um, is one I think that, that really pertains you know, way beyond Liberia and, and has a lot of, should have a lot more traction in the world of development than I think it does. Yeah, I, I would uh, say that I, I agree with everything that, uh, that you both said and very much embrace the an approach that first you know, asks um, how people see the problem, um, learns about how the problem is is, uh, uh, is both perceived and the practical reality, and then tries to tries to address that from from what you've learned from the population. Um, but I also add that that comes with uh, you know, many dilemmas, um, particularly when the uh, the both the interests and even the sort of the worldview or the paradigm that uh, uh, populations uh, view justice through is is quite different from uh, uh, anything we're, we're we're familiar with in the uh, sort of the liberal construct of, of the rule of law. I mean, Pam pointed to and Steve pointed to one example. Um, you know, we are charged as the Carter Center to as a partner with the Ministry of Justice to educate. On, uh, on the new rape law. Um, so uh, a, a new law has been passed that means that uh, there are higher penalties for uh, aggravated uh, categories uh, of rape. Uh, there is a national movement to, uh, to persuade people that if, they are, uh, if there is a crime of rape, it's, it's not just a crime against the individual, it's a crime against the state that this should be taken uh, to the police, to the courts. Uh, and prosecuted as a, as a serious offense. Um, the, the catchphrase is, you know, rape shall not be compromised, meaning compromise means shall not be dealt with uh, in traditional ways within the family, uh, as, as Steve was describing. Um, that, that is a, a very challenging message, as, as Pam has exactly described, to deliver, and, and a very, you know, it's almost an unassailable international orthodoxy um, when you know that that advice is not of any real practical uh, value to, uh, to the people you're giving it to, when there's not a policeman handy, when there's not uh, a court system that can uh, process um, crimes. If we can't, you know, if you think about a crime like rape, the, uh, the, uh, the challenges in, in any successful prosecution uh, in, in, in the West Never mind in an uh, environment where there's no forensics and uh, you know, no uh, really investigative skills. So that, 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 that sort of thing becomes a, a dilemma. There's also um, another good example there is of uh, the use of, uh, in Liberia, what they call sassy wood or, uh, or trial by ordeal, which is very similar to the sort of the ducking stool um, of, uh, of older times here. Uh, same principles involved, 
Um, but they, it's in Liberia, it's within the, uh, uh, the, uh, the context of uh, a culture that believes in the power of the spirits that has uh, deep, deep uh, you know, roots that are kept alive through uh, various uh, cultural societies um, that portion sort of guilt or innocence uh, based on a series of, of practices. And when you, when you have a dialogue about these things, uh, the response is often, well, we know that these, these, uh, some of these things are, don't work. Uh, and what they mean by don't work is not necessarily that they, they don't ascribe guilt or innocence, um, but that they can be corrupted, that you can pay the sassy wood man a little bit and he'll you know, find in your favor or, or against you. But then the question is, well, well what do you replace it with? Um, and that's a little bit of a sort of a thunderbolt when you say, well, how do we establish guilt and innocence in, in our societies? How do we keep law and order locally in our societies? And we sort of unpack that, and it's a very sort of uh, complicated uh, process, largely voluntary um, and uh, with some uh, probability of, of consequence and recourse. Uh, but you can't construct that. You can't sort of come in and replace what, what exists. Uh, but at the same time, you, you certainly can't uh, you know, glorify, I think uh, you might be the term, or, or sort of uh, mythologize uh, you know, traditional cultural practices because they're open to corruption, uh, because some of them may be quite antithetical to a whole layer of, of human rights, uh, um, uh, understandings that, uh, that exist. And so how to sort of mediate between those, do you rush in and you say, uh, um, you know, I'm working with money from uh, the UN, UNIFEM. Um, we're campaigning against female genital mutilation. Um, it's wrong. You should stop. Um, you're not going to get anywhere in that in a cult, in a culture that is, uh, um, uh, you know, where that's that's deeply imbued as a practice. But by the same token, if you don't you know, uh, assert those statements. Well, first of all, you can't take money from Unifem because they'll insist that that's part of your, your, uh, your messaging. Um, and, and secondly, you're, uh, you know, you're leaving something on the table and there's a moral calculation being made in, uh, in this sort of uh, back and forth. Um, so it's a, it's a very sort of challenging area. No, I mean, I th what's interesting is this precise process of hand-wringing that you, and of wrestling with the dilemma. I was wearing a hand. No, it, it actually is unusual because this is, as you point out, there is no hand, hand wringing that I've seen in, in, in a lot of rule of law programs. I mean, it's, of course you go, uh, you know, of course you simply um, make a trial by ordeal um, illegal and prosecute the people, okay? Or, of course, the, the rape law, because it's more severe, is going to deter people. Um, but in fact, I think there are a couple things that, that really pay. One is to recognize the complexity of it, to wrestle with the complexity, and to recognize that these are changes that require, some, in some sense, generational time. You're not going to get the Hail Mary pass. If you really want to have an effect, you have to do it sort of five yards at a time. Um, and uh, we forget that we've done it five yards at a time. You know, half probably more than half of the people in this room couldn't vote 100 years ago, you know, and we could push it back. And so why are we expecting this in a, quote unquote, post-conflict transition period of 1.5 to three years? Uh, I mean, so, but just to, to go back to some of the points, when you start looking at the complexity, l looking at the rape law, I mean, the first thing to recognize is, you know, rape is a terrible problem in Liberia, not just during the war, but in post-war. And the intent of the rape law is the best of intents. It's to stop, to deter it. But the effect of the rape law is not, even you know, women themselves point out that because the rape law has such a severe penalty, and if we go back to the example I gave before, people have to live with, the, you know, they need restorative and so forth, then it's a deterrent. It's a deterrent that some people will not press a rape charge because the penalty is so is so um, severe, and they know that that'll have all sorts of social ramifications. So that becomes self-defeating. Some, in, in some cases, both men and women 
Uh, also talk about rape being, the rape law being deployed or accusations of rape being deployed um, for reasons, you know, there was no rape involved at all, but it's a way to threaten somebody. So in both cases, when you start looking at the situation, there are perverse and unintended consequences um, because, you know, chiefs, the example of customary versus formal system, chiefs report that this is probably one of the types of cases they are most asked by parties to mediate. And by the way, they won't mediate unless both parties come to, are, are asking them. But they refuse because there's a threat. You know, they don't want to get thrown in jail either. They don't want to be part. There's a campaign. The, you know, the solicitor general will get them. What does this mean? It means that well, women are left, many women are left with, uh, with no solution. So the customary system won't deal with them. And if they go to the formal system, they're more likely to be victimized and have no solution either. And so, in fact, you have created, by taking away one alternative, which may not be perfect, which is customary, at the same time that you are building the capacity, so to speak, or the, the power of an institution that is corrupt, you've actually increased, if you want, the, the forms of violence that women experience. The, the, the trial by ordeal is another example. I mean, it's actually a fairly, there, there are varieties of this, and when you look at it, they get fairly complex. Um, but, I mean, one of the things that, that, that you discover is that simply making it illegal doesn't lead people to not believe in it. In fact, mm -hmm. they come up with other solutions, other ways of interpreting it. And again, we'll go back to some of the research. And so this is the logic. The logic is, okay, you are, first of all, I think you have to understand the ontology. You have to understand how people are thinking about this. It's, uh, say, I get malaria and you get malaria. Um, it's not that people don't accept that that was transmitted by a mosquito. They'll accept that. But they ask a second question that in our society we don't ask, which is, why did it bite you and not me? Now, our ontology is chance. You know, it's random. And they will put a moral attribution. There's something wrong in the social or in the spiritual world that caused that. That's very hard to refute. Uh, I mean, it's, it's simply a presupposition, much as ours is about chance. So they are always looking for a more fundamental cause, and in fact, they want to treat that, because if you simply treat, you know, take the malarone or whatever your malaria medicine, quinine, but you don't treat the more fundamental cause, then it's going to reemerge somewhere else, and so they're concerned with this. This is what trial by ordeal is usually invoked to do, or at least in some cases. Um, so simply saying it, it doesn't exist, it's not real, doesn't lead people to not believe in it. They, they start saying, okay, you are prohibiting trial by ordeal. Therefore, bad things, as they happen, are caused, witchcraft is on the rise. Now, they'll ask a question, who is, who is benefiting from the rise of witchcraft? Who is benefiting from the rise of spirit? Well, people who engage in that, witches and sorcerers or whatever the local term is. And so you get interpretations that say, well, clearly the solicitor general must be part of these snake societies because he's the one who's driving the prohibition of trial by ordeal, which would allow us to deal with witchcraft. Only a witch would do that. N now, that's not the intention of the law, but it creates a huge problem. It creates, it delegitimizes a government. So you have to start thinking, okay, what are the other potential approaches? There are, if you want, there are people within the society themselves who are coming up with their own solutions. Um, and the law is the bluntest of instruments and sometimes has these black, uh, blowback effects. I think that instead of trying to, again, bringing these assumptions that go within this rule of law paradigm, you have to go out and you have to have these dialogues and you identify who are the creative thinkers in the society. Who are com who, who's coming up with the, I mean, so you have the Pentecostal churches, which are talking about the Holy Spirit is dealing with this, or others. You know, there are, there are the, 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 there is in any society a range of people who are coming up with creative and new ideas for dealing with this. But you need to tap those rather than simply bringing the assumptions to bear. And I think some of the dialogues that Carter, but others, uh, JPC, AFL, and others have conducted have moved in that direction uh, and, and much the, more promising. And actually, uh, some of the, the di well, I don't know, dialogues, but some of the processes I've found, um, I think, are most creative and actually least sort of imperialistic um, are the uh, some of the practices the Carter Center is doing, which is to support drama groups, um, radio programs, um, and I attended one um, drama performance where 
um, the Bong Youth Association went out to a village and did a very short, you know, five minute skit on domestic violence. And the whole village was there. Some of the women were out in the fields working, but most of the village was there. And they watched the performance and then the Bong Youth Association used the performance. There was a man who was, I think he beat his wife because she didn't have the water on, ready at the table or something. And then they started a dialogue with the community about was he in the wrong and if he was, why? And was she in the wrong for not having brought the water? And this conversation went on for you know a good hour and then it opened up um, a sort of further conversation where people started asking general questions about justice. Um, so a man said, do I have to look after the child of my, my girlfriend, she had him during the war, I don't know who the father is, she's not really sure who the father is, he's not my child, do I have to send him to school, I don't really want to, and then there was a conversation about, well, what is your role as a Liberian man in the post-conflict setting, yes, probably you should be looking after this boy, it's not his fault, not your wife's fault, um, but uh, it seemed to me that that process of conversation might be one of the very best um, aspects and processes of justice that Liberia will actually see, and that it's not a, that that we tend, um, particularly development agencies and funders, for for under, you know understandable reasons, tend to want to focus on the outcomes. You know, how many people did you visit? How many workshops? Give me, give us the numbers, and if you don't give us the numbers, we can't give you more funding. When in fact, the point might really be that it's the process that that some of the most meaningful transformations and ideas that the people have about the world might be in conversations that you really can't document very well, you might be able to ask them afterwards, that they're qualitative but very meaningful experiences and that part of what we need to do is to take, um, and really it's a feminist point I suppose, but to take conversation and process as something that's actually meaningful and worry less about the structured outcome. Um, yeah, and I think, I think that's a lesson that's Again, I, I, I wish that the development agencies would take much more seriously, even as we move ever more into the era of um, statistics and quantification and numbers. I think we really miss really profound opportunities and moments of transformation that get undocumented because they can't be counted. I want to uh, open the floor up in, uh, in a second. Uh, first, just to respond very briefly to a couple of uh, Steve's points. Um, one on the question of paradigm. Uh, one of the other things that the Carter Center is, is trying to uh, uh, help with in, in Liberia is uh, challenges of uh, mental health. Um, our mental health program here uh, predominantly works on uh, US national issues, but uh, has been invited by the Ministry of Health there to address what they've identified as one of their, uh, one of their main uh, priorities. Um, principally, through their lens, this is uh, issues of uh, post-traumatic stress, but also uh, the full, full range of uh, other uh, mental illnesses. Uh, but the, uh, as Steve says, the, the concept of what, uh, what a mental illness is, and particularly what causes a mental illness, is, uh, is particularly uh, uh, at a stark contrast to uh, um, the, uh, uh, the sort of the scientific uh, understanding. Um, it's almost always uh, spirit driven. It's almost always that the cause of mental illness is uh, some problem with the individual or some problem with the individual's family that they've been in some way um, possessed. And so you know, having that dialogue and how you can where you can begin that conversation is something that uh, you know the people uh, working on this are, are really uh, wrestling with in some very uh, uh, very creative uh, ways. Uh, I think the other point that I want to pick up on of Steve's is the um, uh, is, is taking this almost this sort of soft approach to uh, developing a, uh, a culture of uh, of um, peaceful interaction where people start to feel that they have some access to justice. But how, how does that intersect with the, uh, the harder realities of, of you know, local government, uh, people with money who will come and take your land, the police that are corrupt, the, uh, uh, the ethnic groups that uh, remain sort of dominated by their, their hardliners and the, the, the real flashpoints of sort of land disputes and other things. Um, and, and 
part of the answer to that is, is the, the, the desperate need for um, uh, a twofold, the desperate need for sort of credible places where people can go to resolve these differences at the lowest levels. So if the uh, traditional leadership is, is, is uh, somehow um, uh, corrupted or damaged by, uh, by the war, as, as every institution was, how do you help it to, uh, to grow, to change, to modernize so that it can deal with things at, at a local level? People like the um, uh, community legal advisor we saw before. Um, how can you, uh, you know, strengthen the, the, the formal system to address uh, problems? How can you prevent the repetition of, of, of the same problems uh, by you know, bringing the police into these kinds of dialogues as well as just the, the community? And so at each stage you have a shared understanding of what should be happening uh, in, in the hope that people can start to you know, keep each other honest. You can't mediate an ethnic uh, dispute, which desperately needs to be mediated, if you have no credibility, if you're just the government who flies in for a day, or if you're the government that's the cause of the problem. You need to have some form of devolved uh, authority uh, and trust to, uh, to what may be a formal group, it may be an informal group, but you absolutely have to uh, um, you know, understand the situation and be creative. And so part of this approach is to try and prevent the uh, uh, you know, old mistakes being, being repeated. Um, I don't know, Pam or Steve, if you ever want to make a final comment think, in the conversation, mm -hmm. then we'll open it up. So one of the hallmarks of, this, of a different type of approach that, that really matters, especially in sort of this, again, new dispensation of, uh, of sort of hyper-accounting yeah. up, the, up the chain of command, to people that are further and further removed from the actual practice is the need, the deep need, sort of cultivating a culture of humility that recognizes that you don't know. You have to go and you have to study. The, are the police in this, how are the police viewed in this context? Are they corrupt? Are they not corrupt? What are the local institutions? Which are working? Which are not working? Uh, how do different, these are all questions that, um, that that require an answer in order to come up with, uh, with a satisfying answer to this question of access to justice. And they require going, and again, uh, you know, I am a researcher, so I'm not, not sort of tooting that horn just because I'm a researcher, but it's evidence-based policymaking or evidence-based practice, empirical. I mean, it, there is no such thing, actually, as non-empirical knowledge. Empiros means it's Greek. It's evidence-based. It's experience-based. That The question is, Whose experience? Mm -hmm. Is it based on the experience of the people in, in the context, their understanding of what the problems are, their, experience, you know, their realities? Uh, and if it's not, it's almost a sure bet that you're simply floating in your experience and assuming that that's theirs, that the institutions you can rely on if, uh, if you suffer, you know, or if somebody in your family suffers rape, or the, you know, that your experience with the police in our society is anything comparable in that, to that. So the question is, th there's a real need to cultivate sort of a, a spirit of humility and an approach that, that first seeks to really understand the context in its complexity uh, and not in a patronizing way or that doesn't look at difference and simply assume that because it's different, it's wrong. There may be a rationale that when we look a little bit more deeply makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think that, again, there's a minority uh, group, uh, iconoclastic, if you want, group of, of, of organizations that hold to that approach in a sea change of the development that is moving in, in some ways in the other way. And, and there's great value to that. Thank you. We'd love to, to hear from you. Um, is, uh, any thoughts, comments, observations? I have a question in uh, two areas. Uh, if you go into the, the rural areas and ask uh, someone in a remote village, do you want rule of law? When he thinks of law, would he think of what my tribe customs are and how likely is it that my tribe's customs and somebody else's tribe's customs are mutually exclusive and are they open to the idea that we might have to 
take some laws we're not real wild about, and so will the other guy. The other area I question policemen, uh, where do they get these guys? I've never heard a good word about a policeman in Africa and in most of the world. Now, do they get any kind of training? Who wants to be a policeman? Is it, is it the guy that really loves raping and, and gets a big kick out of banging on people's heads and, and likes extortion? Why would he want to be a policeman? Do the elite hire them and do they say, you can do what you want, just take care of me? I, what's the philosophy of the police themselves? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I take a small effort at that. Uh, I think the, on the, the first question about uh, you know, different cultures and different approaches to, uh, to solving problems, uh, I mean, it's an excellent one, and there's, there's no sort of easy answer. It, it's, it's something that each country needs to, uh, to work out for itself, what their tolerance is for uh, differences within, within a, a single justice system. Um, you know, some cultures uh, in, in Ghana, for example, they, have a, they, they benefit from having a fairly um, uniform um, customary system, and so therefore they can have uh, a justice system that has, it's a unitary system, but it has two tracks. You can choose to um, uh, take your justice from the customary system or from the formal system, and if you're in the customary system, you can you know, appeal all the way up to the, uh, the House of Chiefs uh, and then even beyond that to the Supreme Court. So there's a single ultimate jurisdiction. But um, you know, your own level of, 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 of comfort with the, uh, with, the, with the justice of the outcome determines how, how high you go. Somewhere like, like Liberia and many other places, there's quite a lot of differences in, uh, in, in approach, but not necessarily, or in, in the detail, but not necessarily in the overall philosophy, sort of the restorative uh, approach where rather than uh, you know exacting the, the the pound of flesh, you rather um, find a number of communal ways to uh, to sort of bridge the gap. But you know, I was saying before, where that stands in contrast to what the the national law says or what human rights uh, commitments might be, um, you know, there's no real easy answers. So it has to be sort of mediated uh, within each. Uh, Country, just as you know, I as an Englishman am very surprised in in, in the states uh, what kinds of rights are devolved to the states. I would think, well, that's got to be a national question, but but no, you know, the the history of the United States has has, has, has worked things out in in uh, uh, different ways. And in terms of police, I mean, it, it's um, it's typically a you know a badly paid profession. Uh, there's typically you know temptation. There's typically nepotism and. In, in the hiring, um, uh, you know, just as you have corrupt police departments in, in the U.S., that you know the exact same uh, principles operate. Uh, there are there are good policemen. Um, there's no doubt. We've we've hired at the Carter Center a couple of Liberians who are very senior police who've sort of risen up the ranks and uh, have had to leave at various times because of, of problems there. Um, but uh, there's a lot, uh, lot to be said for the need for survival on, on low wages. And when you're paid below a living wage uh, and you, you have power um, and there's nobody uh, there to hold you to account, um, you know, the worst, uh, the worst in human nature can, comes out, I think. And uh, it's very difficult to reform. Um, I mean, I do think it gets back to the um, partly the issue of the state. And in Liberia, uh, it's not that big a country, but there are no, I mean, the roads basically don't work. So it's something that would take, you know, a road that should take you half an hour to get from one town to another might take you two days because uh, for so much of Liberia's history, their leads did not invest in infrastructure. They kept the money in Monrovia or somewhere else. And so the fundamental issues of access that would help, you know, create a police force that would be more responsive. Um, I mean, they're just a really fundamental issues of access, roads, infrastructure that um, lend themselves to the kind of coalescence of power around individuals in particular areas that, that 
you know, wouldn't probably happen if there were other things that had been invested in over the years. And it's not the fault of the current government, it's, it's the, the history of uh, elites not sharing the wealth. I, I think that policeman question actually points to a potentially really interesting different line of inquiry or, or, or than, than you typically see, which is, I mean, as you point out, the, you know, the police are paid, is it $30 a month or $70 a month? I mean, in a country where that's, you have a family, you have, you know, that's two sacks of rice for a month. Um, I, I mean, I would contend that if that, if our police were paid here similarly, that we might have comparable problems. Um, so you have to look at that reality, and then if you look at that reality, you start to recognize, okay, this has been, like, even before the war, there were problems in this respect. Can the country afford a large police force? Okay, well, this is one of the reasons that customary systems have a certain level of prominence, and why people don't try to appeal to the police or appeal to prisons, another cost. They look for solutions that, meet the social and economic reality. There's some wisdom to that. So that, you know, that can point you in another direction is maybe you start with a smaller police force that is better paid and focuses on only certain types of crimes in this reality. I mean, it can lead you, that precise type of question, I think, can you lead you into sort of innovative ways of looking at this. Um, uh, and it's not just a matter of these are more corrupt people. There are people in more extenuating circumstances than our police necessarily face, and they react probably not unlike some people might in our society if they were faced with the same thing. And that also leads, you can't train that away. I mean, it's very interesting to me that development or rule of law falls back when everything else fails on education and training, as if putting up more signs saying don't be corrupt or don't pay fees is going to change the salary that the person gets. It's not. You know, and, and that's, but it does fulfill the ticking of the, oh, we put up 600 signs that say don't be corrupt, you know, therefore we've done something, you know, and we can sign that off and get our next um, congressional appropriation. Um, I'm, I'm being a little sarcastic. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. Um, so far, uh, your discussions have been um, very critical of a development agenda of, um, a kind of colonial state and post-colonial state. Um, I'm wondering, and you've looked to, to uh, customary uh, law and, and customary um, uh, relationships to, to provide an alternative. I'm wondering what you think of international agreements like CEDAW, the Beijing agreements, um, UN Resolution 1325 as being something that can also serve as a way to kind of reach out for justice. I'm thinking particularly in Zimbabwe, um, during the period of the late 1980s and 1990s, as the state was becoming more authoritarian, um, women's groups in Zimbabwe did look to those agreements to kind of make their case for a kind of justice that they thought um, they should get in that country. Um, absolutely, I mean, I think having international agreements like CEDAW, which of course uh, the United States has not signed, um, what, what, is, what is CEDAW, Pam? Um, the Convention to, uh, all forms of uh. discrimination, to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women. Mm -hmm. uh, America, the United States has not signed, one of the very few countries not to have done so. Um, but these, and there's a campaign underway at the moment to get uh, the United States to sign that agreement. So these international agreements which put women's rights on the agenda of international you know, human rights and human rights law, I think are really crucial as aspirational you know, they, they help people, they give people a lever to use against their governments. And they do, I think, are very important in helping communities um, take their government to task around certain issues. Um, and to some extent, those international agreements around women's rights have driven the development agenda in the last few years. So 1325, which is a Security Council resolution from 2000, which says that women need to be involved in peacekeeping at the peace table and pays particular attention to the uh, sexual violence against women and girls during times of war has been very important in making the case that women's, women's quote-unquote, women's issues are actually international security issues. Um, so now uh, countries such as Liberia, I think Liberia did the first one, are coming up with national action plans which um, aspire to put into place mechanisms in the society that will 
show that Liberia is in accordance with 1325 in terms of having women in peacekeeping forces, etc., etc. Um, so I'm in favour of those agreements, and I think we've seen a really a sea change, particularly since Beijing 1995. When and again, the importance of the Beijing um, declarations was that women from NGOs, particularly in the global south, were really important in driving those um, that agenda about taking women's rights seriously as an international human rights. Um, to me, the problem comes in that sort of tricky area between um, having these sort of categories of aspiration or these agreements and what they mean on the ground. And so at the moment, I'm, I'm busy uh, thinking through a paper on national action plans. And one of the things that worries me is, again, because the model of governance is assumed to be something that looks like a Scandinavian welfare state. And you know, you speak to people in Denmark, they say, even there, it's not so great when you look at it closely. But nonetheless, um, that there's a real imperative uh, at the, level, at the level of the, sort of the national level to draw up an actual plan, an act, a national action plan around 1325 that looks, they begin to look very similar. And so they begin to be more and more, um, there seems to be more and more of a disjuncture between these kind of national plans that aspire to be in accordance with things like CEDAW and Security Council Resolution 1325 and what might actually work on the ground to ensure women's rights. And so you end up with exactly the same kind of disjuncture. So it's not, I am in favor of Beijing, I'm in favor of these, I'm in favor of UN women. Um, it's, it's how they get translated on the ground and the way that the, the intellectual um, contributions that, that people, women in the global south, men in the global south on the ground in the grassroots organization somehow the way that their intellectual contribution doesn't make it into these plans or doesn't make it into the agenda that worries me. Yeah, I mean, just to, to, to add to that, I think these are incredibly important um, for the long game. And I think this is what you mean by aspirational. The question is, how exactly do they get used? I mean, if they are put out there and um, communities or women or, I mean, we could talk about various different constituencies reach out and leverage those at some point um, and even try to do that in order to make change on the ground, that's terrific. The problem comes when um, something like that is used, uh, one of these, are, uh, to disqualify, for example, uh, if the result of, if, if a national action plan in Liberia uh, in order to, um, to conform with these various different agreements and instruments um, has to prohibit the use of uh, all customary, customary authorities cannot uh, weigh in on gender-based violence issues, period. If that's, if that's considered the criteria for meeting this, um, then it produces the type of situation I talked about earlier, is women, for example, who are suffering from gender-based violence end up having no recourse. You know, rather than having recourse, and we could go into the ways in which um, customary systems, when they're working, um, correctly actually do address many of the concerns of women who face gender-based violence. Um, so it's how it's used. Is it used as part of this long game or is it become something that, that, uh, that, that um, uh, preempts other options that may not be perfect but are working and provide a better solution um, than, uh, than creating a justice vacuum? You know, and so I think it's not whether they're good or bad, it's how exactly are they being deployed um, and with what temporal perspective. Sorry, can I just, yeah. But, but I, I also wouldn't want to uh, leave tonight with the idea that I'm completely in uncritical favor of customary-based practices either, because I think for many women, these aren't always you know, so helpful. So, but I think the key is flexibility, um, finding what works, and so that I think there, there are examples where the customary system works very well for women, where women can go and appeal to an elder, there's negotiation, there are other places where it doesn't work well at all. Um, and so I think that the problem is the prescribing, is that too often the problems are identified from outside and the solutions to those already identified problems are identified from outside. And that, that is the problem for me. I, I'm much happier with a, um, a kind of approach where people wrestle with various answers, and I think one's much more likely to find sustainability in those kind of wrestlings than one is in, in kind of things that are imposed. I think the, uh, the question of what works is, is absolutely the, the critical one, at least in, in the short term. Um, 
but that gets to how do you how do you know what works as well? And you get back to the sort of the measurement challenge. I mean, I think it's important for people to uh, wrestle with justifying the outcome of their intervention. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're doing empowerment uh, and you're educating people about a particular UN uh, mechanism, what is the outcome of that? Uh, if you're, you know, at the community level talking to people about uh, gender-based violence and, and the kinds of sort of dramas you're describing, mm -hmm. is, is that a, an approach that has the, the better outcome or the preferred outcome? Mm -hmm. um, not simple, I think. Let me acknowledge uh, and embarrass perhaps uh, Jeff Austin, who is a former uh, employee <laughs> of the Carter Center in, in Harper in, in Liberia. His uh, Liberian name is Wisa. So Mr. Wisa, the floor. Thanks, Tom. Um, we've been talking about Liberia's dual uh, justice system, its customary system, and its national or statutory system. I want to know what you all think that relationship might be like in 10 years or in the future sometime, how the current government sees that, of Ellen Johnson's relief, and what a future government, because Liberia is facing elections this year, might, might do to support that or encourage the, the customary system as well as the statutory system. Uh, the, the short answer to that is it, it's a little difficult to tell in the middle of an election year uh, where, where, where these questions become political. Part of what Jeff is asking is um, uh, gets to the reform process in Liberia uh, for the what they have is a dual justice system currently, uh, a formal track uh, under the uh, judiciary, and then there is a uh, administrative uh, track under the executive whereby the chiefs um, can uh, exercise some uh, judicial authority that's uh, appealed up through the superintendent and the executive. Um, that's also a larger symptom of, of challenges of governance where it, it's not really clear what the functions of local functionaries are. Um, this has gotten lost in... Uh, in um, uh, through the war, it, it, it needs uh, reform and rationalization. Uh, so we at the center have been working on one piece of that, which is trying to uh, gather the information uh, with, with Liberian attorneys of, on, that will allow them to make decisions about how to uh, um, rationalize the, uh, the justice system. I don't think that'll take place in an election year. The traditional constituency is, is quite an important one. Um, and so there'll be some, you know, uh, juggling there. But that, there also needs to be local governance reform hand in hand uh, if, if the system is, is to work properly. There's been a lot of talk about the need for decentralization, but I think they're, they're properly moving uh, quite slowly on all of this um, and uh, not rushing to any, uh, any, any quick solution. Uh, whether this will, you know, the momentum such as it is, will continue, uh, you know, depends on the, uh, the the next government and and its interests. Um, but I think there's a real, uh, a real um, intellectual uh, understanding at the moment that the power needs to be decentralised. Uh, that President Sirleaf has stated regularly that the, the country can't survive if all the power remains within the hands of the presidency. But that's, uh, you know, that's one of the hardest things to operationalize, to give up your own, uh, uh, give up your own power. We know here that uh, you know, although the government might shut, shut down, the uh, congressman would still be paid. So, uh, um, you know, we, we see. I'd be interested in knowing to what extent uh, those in the Liberian diaspora are involved in discussing uh, these kinds of issues, and if they are, to what extent uh, they might be influential in changes that might be taking place in Liberia? Mm. I think the Liberian diaspora has uh, been engaged in, in probably two main levels. Um, one has been around the, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The Liberian TRC was the first ever to include the testimony of people living in the diaspora. Uh, and so there's been a lot of engagement around, around those issues. Uh, the second, I think, is in the um, 
less in the sort of everyday discussion of the, the issues that we're talking about here, but in the, in the practical uh, fact of the, uh, the return of many uh, well-educated Liberians to the country to, uh, you know, to lend their, their shoulders to the wheel. Uh, and the kinds of uh, ideas that they're bringing with them from their times and experiences in the U.S. and how those ideas fit into the, uh, the changed Liberian reality. Uh, so some of the things that we're discussing here about the sort of disjuncture between um, different paradigms uh, you know, are, are relevant in that context, people from the diaspora coming back with, with different expectations. Um, but uh, you know, I think on the uh, well, and, and I'll, I'll let Steve comment more because he actually, actually, this is one of his areas of expertise. So, what am I talking about? <laughs> no, actually, the, the 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 TRC point I think is is very interesting uh, because again, the the diaspora did participate uh, in the TRC, and um, I I think that. The, the, maybe the first thing to think about the diaspora is the diaspora is as varied and heterogeneous as the country of Liberia itself. I mean, when we say the diaspora, you know, it's, it's, I remember, I think it was somebody from USAID saying, you know, how frustrated they were because the diaspora couldn't just get it together and present a single face. You know, what state, what, you know, what group can do that? They, I mean, they, the diaspora hails from all parts of Liberia different cohorts that came at different times, the winners in one, you know, in one session of the war were the losers in the next, and are as divided in many ways um, as, as Liberians themselves are, um, although they share some types of experiences here. Um, but even those experiences themselves are varied. Um, you know, it's interesting that there's, there's sort of a theory of you know, people come to a democracy and experience it, and then they serve as sort of the proponents of of democracy abroad, as if they sort of absorbed that by osmosis. Um, that's not necessarily the case. And so you do have exemplar people who are going back in this new dispensation, and we could point to several of the ministers, which you will not find in Monrovia in December. They're in North Carolina or Washington or wherever their families are. Um, they, uh, they, they hail from the diaspora. And uh, I think the Minister of Justice would be a good example of somebody who's really, or the maybe the former Minister of Justice, I can't remember if she just got reappointed or not, but she, um, you know, a real advocate for, for, uh, for practical approaches to gender, uh, gender justice. But you have equally people who uh, are returning to Liberia um, precisely because they can leverage resources that they have here uh, in order to pursue advantage there. And so one of the major areas in which this is a concern, although it's probably flying somewhat under the radar of the international community, is in land claims. Because the, the diaspora, you know, if you're from the diaspora, um, you know, and you're making $2,500 a month, which is more than a minister makes, um, you can leverage that in a corrupt justice system to further your land claim. So you have, you know, much as in Liberia, you have some policemen that are you know, good and others that aren't, and you have people that are pursuing sort of the whole gamut in the diaspora as well. I think they are, you know, the one thing that can be said about them is they do have more resources to bring to bear, regardless of where they fall on that spectrum of trying to support the types of positive change that we might want, or uh, in some ways perpetrating, um, you know, or uh, promoting practices that could undermine peace and justice as well. I mean, you know, it pays to remember that you know, Charles Taylor built his um, base of support as a student at, what was it, Bryant or one of the business schools near Boston. And, you know, the, the diaspora was involved in several uh, of the, the more, you know, insidious uh, episodes in Liberian history. And it was also involved in the peace building, which people tend to forget as well. So I think it covers, it is influential. It's often forgotten how important it is. Um, uh, but it's definitely a factor, if only because it brings a lot more resources to bear um, than necessarily are available there. Last question, please. Thank you. Last question. Um, I know uh, real of, of law programs in Egypt and Bulgaria have focused uh, not, not just only on this issue, but, but have given it uh, a, a fair amount of, uh, of investment 
and time in developing commercial code. And I would assume that this um, is the result of interests, both military and uh, corporate interests, in uh, foreign investment and international trade. Has this had an effect, a positive or negative effect, on, on human rights in those countries? And has it perhaps uh, not really allowed a proper focus on this more community-based development? And, and what is the U.S. interest in community-based in, you know, negotiations? I mean, I don't know why we would want to invest in that as opposed to investing in the commercial cut. I, I mean, I, I know uh, that's it. that was echoed very much in the description of the uh, the initial approach to the rule of law in Liberia, that you need the rule of law so that people can do business. Um, and that that was, uh, you know, a, a, a principal target. Um, one hopes that that, uh, you know, as time passes, there's an evolving view that you can't do business unless there's uh, um, a, a, a bedrock of, um, uh, of peace and, and social order. I think uh, you know, Afghanistan is an interesting example here is the sort of the strategy of, uh, of the, the US in, in quote unquote nation building has, uh, has tried to adapt to uh, you know, the uh, uh, unsuccessful efforts at a sort of a top-down uh, approach, which I'd equate with the, the commercial code uh, question, and is now trying to um, uh, work from the community up more, so that there's a you know there's a consensus uh, um, more. Um, but it is uh, so the so the interest is uh, in what again in, in what works, what's effective. Um, that is tied into what is the goal, um, and uh, you know, in Egypt, working on the commercial code has not, uh, you know, furthered the uh, the stability of the country. If that was the the interest, or working on the commercial code alone, so there may be a lesson to be drawn from uh, from from the current uh, wave of uh, uh, of um, uh, revolt. Um, but I, don't know. I know nothing about Bulgaria or Egypt, so I can't speak to those situations. But uh, you know, if you if you were to take the approach, uh, you know, and I sort of laid out the, the the different approaches and visions of rule of law, and one of these is, um, I don't think it's necessarily even limited to the commercial code, but in throughout Africa, uh, especially in post-conflict countries where this is operationalized the probably most in U.S. foreign policy or USAID's approach. Um, and not only, others as well, is in land tenure, um, land tenure law, and uh, trying to change, uh, change the rules that govern land tenure and the privatization and the sale of land. Uh, and I think that that, you know, then the question becomes, um, uh, whose interests is it promoting? And often the thrust of the policy is, uh, is to promote the interest of corporations that would want to invest in, in land, or I mean, we could talk about you know, whether it's for carbon exchange or you know, to grow. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of different variants of this. Um, but it, also, it, it often has a series of uh, mixed effects. And some of them, are, there are, as in everything, winners and losers. Uh, and I think there's, in particular, in when we take a gender perspective, women are often the losers. Um, I mean, let me sort of go back to Mozambique, which is actually where I've done research for far longer than, than Liberia. You have land tenure systems. You know, we think, okay, this acre here belongs to you. You have title. That means everything on it is yours. Um, and if you have customary systems in Mozambique, um, you know, you may have, this may be your piece of land that's been assigned to you while, while you're alive. But by the way, during the hunting, hunting season, the young men are allowed to hunt on your land. And women own the, 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 the products of the trees, you know, the fruit trees. Now, you know, that the, I've seen uh, the thrust of policy being trying to simplify that. Well, what, simplify in what way? Well, basically to reduce all of that to a system that we recognize and that, can, that we can work with or that uh, foreign um, businesses can, can um, can work with, which usually means that um, you know there is a push for legislation that will recognize this acre and everything on it as yours. So you actually may win 
Okay, I mean, I don't, maybe that helps your right. But you, you know, you've lost your access to the trees, you know, and so it, it, I think it's complicated. But in Africa, I think it, it, you see this the most in the push towards land tenure reform, even more so than, than, than the commercial code. Uh, I, but again, I know nothing about Bulgaria or Egypt. Um, but with regard to Liberia, um, I would say one of the things that Ellen Johnson Sirleaf inherited was this incredible, um, these contracts that were made you know, in the early 20th century to fight with Firestone in particular mm -hmm. that gave so many of the revenues straight to Firestone and not to the Liberian government. Um, and one of the things she's really done is try to renegotiate those contracts um, because it really hampers her government, her ability to actually you know, develop roads and, and pay policemen is hampered by the fact that so much of the revenue is still going out to these foreign companies. And so I think, she, I think one of the, I don't know whether it's a, it's a success, but certainly one of the successful motivations of her presidency has been to go around the, the, the world, going to companies saying, you know, you made, you know, you drew up a contract with Charles Taylor. Surely you can see that's an illegitimate contract. We need to renegotiate. So I think she's really tried to put that on the agenda. Whether it comes exactly under rule of law, I'm not sure, but, but she has really paid attention to those commercial contracts. Okay. Well, with, with that, um, uh, let me thank you, Pam, and uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to share this uh, time with you and uh, with, with all of you as well. Thank you uh, so much for coming. Um, a couple of small housekeeping notes. Uh, the next program in the Conversations at the Carter Center series uh, it's called Behind the Scenes of Foul Water, Fiery Serpent, a new documentary on guinea worm disease. Uh, this is a, a webcast-only event, uh, Thursday, April 7, uh, at 7 p.m., uh, where you'll be able, when you'll be able to see exclusive footage and hear stories from the field from the filmmakers of this uh, uh, documentary that chronicles the census historic campaign to eradicate uh, guinea worm disease. Um, it'll be, you'll be able to see it at uh, cartercenter.org uh, uh, and other conversations in the future at cartercenter.org uh, slash conversations. Uh, and also there are iTunes podcasts you can subscribe to. Uh, finally, a plug for a, a Liberia-related book launch on the 24th of March at the uh, Jimmy Carter Library and Museum, uh, a new book by uh, Liberian woman Agnes Kamara, who has written on her experiences in the war and on uh, the uh, experiences of uh, child soldiers uh, in Liberia. Uh, and it's getting its formal launch uh, at that time, 24th at 7 p.m. at the library. Um, so thank you all so very much for being here. Thank you to Deb Hakes, especially for uh, organizing this. Uh, and we look forward to uh, your continued uh, interest and uh, your continued uh, participation in future events. So thank you. Thanks, Steve.